welcome to the last session of today. Uh, I'm going to be chatting with agent Fiona Keddy Ord, uh, who is the managing director and founder of uh, Keddy Scott Associates. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you want to ask questions throughout this session, we would love you to do that. You do need to be subscribed to our YouTube channel uh, to interact uh, live with this Q&A. Uh, but we are really encouraging uh, questions about all kinds of uh, elements of being an agent or approaching an agent um, as we go through this Q&A. Um, so I'm just going to bring Fiona into the stream. Hi, Fee. Hi. Um, so welcome to Collective Creative Initiative. Thank you for coming on this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction and correct me if any of this is wrong. So Fiona studied, you studied theatre and music at University of Glasgow and then went on to do a vocational diploma at LSNT, London School of Musical Theatre. And you worked as an actor across several productions and genres before starting uh, Kelly Scott Associates in 2003. So this was kind of like a founding moment kind of in your living room yeah. clients but you were still kind of working as an actor is that right that's right yeah yeah so when I started it was in you know the super baby stages I was 23 years old um I was waiting tables uh, in Canary Wharf auditioning for shows and um and I I, I kind of just started in a, a representing a couple of friends and just kind of promoting them so from a PR kind of push and and then sort of trying to find job opportunities for them and then yeah I kind of really had a feel for it and it, it seemed to go quite well so I sort of just kept pushing down that route until eventually it really just took over and I didn't want to act anymore so there was a there was definitely a crossover between the two careers but um agenting was kind of like finding myself a little bit uh <laughs> that doesn't sound too ridiculous it it was um it was a, a sort of enlightening moment so 2003 you're right that was the very very early stages much more official in 2005 you know kind of with an office and a, and a real list of clients type of setup that's still quite quick isn't it for a turnaround in terms of taking it from an idea to then office lots of clients mm -hmm. Yeah, reasonably quick. And obviously it was a less traditional route in that um, most people, most sensible people would actually go and and work with another agent for um, a period of time and really learn from a mentor and someone that really knows what they're doing as opposed to kind of jump in feet first, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. Um, however, that's that's what I did. But, but I was very young at the time and very happy to learn slowly my clients were aware that that was my situation so I wasn't expecting kind of magic to happen overnight and I was very happy to take a lot of time and finding my feet and learning my craft as I went um, mm. and and garnering those contacts as well I mean obviously that's that's one of the biggest things so you start you start where you know in the areas that I had been working in as an actor and then you grow from there um, but but yeah working with another agent is probably what I would advise if anyone was thinking of doing the same thing that crossover from being a performer to an agent I think it's it's more beneficial to go and work with someone and, and learn from them um if I was going to do it over again interesting because obviously as um, Pearson casting we started the same way um so we kind of did start inside um an, a big uh, corporate company in the states and then kind of came over here but we didn't have that background of kind of learning the, the pitfalls and the early um you know the, the processes and you know building those relationships on your own from scratch is probably the hardest thing is that do you would you agree I would definitely agree yeah it is it's it's quite a slog and um, I mean I think I think it's fine as long as you know that it's got to be super long game you know that, that you're, you're not going to be um to a you know a level that you might aspire to be in any there's no quick path to it you have to think of it as a really long term reach um in, in which case there's not really any pitfall in going and getting your experience with someone else mm. um however you know this is the way that some people just end up doing it and so uh, it's it's not really to put anyone off doing that it's actually it's actually more just that i would say there's there's a lot of extra challenges involved with it um that you can possibly get by 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 learning properly through someone else but that said you know i don't regret 
it at all. It's worked out well, but it just, it takes a long time to do that. It takes a long time to really learn. I mean, you never stop learning. Every day we're learning about sort of new people and new genres and new processes. And, you know, something like this comes along, a virus and lockdown happens and suddenly we have to change the way that we work overnight. So, um, yeah. so yeah, every day is a school day. So um, I just want to go way, way back. So what first got you into acting? What drew you into the industry in the first place before being an agent was even kind of on in, on the horizon? What was it about performing and how, when did that start for you? Um, it started actually really far back, uh, not, not necessarily performing on stage, but um, like really far back in primary school. Uh, actually from a music background first, I just did really well in music class and so started playing musical instruments privately with a with a tutor that come and come and take me out of you know English or math or something and then I'd have half an hour of uh, brass tuition and I seem to be particularly decent at picking up instruments and so um, a possible music career was kind of on the horizon and then through through I mean I definitely got involved in plays and things in the playground at Plank mm. School but then into secondary school doing drama I ended up doing higher drama and English literature and I was just really into that as well. So it was about how do I find a career that actually straddles both the stage and the music that, that feeds both of those desires. And so I kind of went musical theatre then. <laughs> it needs to be I musical theatre. So, yeah, but, I mean, I had singing lessons from through primary school as well. So, I mean, that was really starting to grow before I even really knew about the genre of musical theatre. Mm. Um, but I was quite keen to have an academic degree first. And also I just kind of really wanted to go and go to university in Glasgow and live there for three years. So I did that first and then did the, the one year in London, which was great. Amazing. And when you were an actor, what was it? What did you love most and what did you hate about the industry? What were the kind of two extreme things that you loved about it and, and disliked? Um... I don't know if I hated anything about the industry. That's such an interesting question. I mean, I I loved auditioning. I really loved it. I didn't I didn't dread auditions. Of course, I would get nervous, um, but I, like that kind of really exciting nervous, that sort of uh, butterflies in your belly, but not overwhelming anxiety nervous. So a nice a nice level of nerves. And I used to just enjoy the processes, um, almost like kind of free workshops. A lot of the additions that I did do were quite workshop based. Somehow having studied in commercial musical theatre, I then very naturally fell into anything but commercial musical theatre. And I did mostly quite divisory work using puppets and um, using musical instruments and um, uh, classical texts a lot as well. I did a lot of um, Greek play work and Shakespeare. Always had a trombone in my hand, and uh, quite often, yeah, the other hand was operating a puppet. So I, I guess it was kind of the early stages of that big craze that became the actor muso and the actor actor puppeteer. Um, when when that was really starting to become a big thing, mm. um, and I and I loved that. I find that fascinating. Kind of the more the more things that you could incorporate into make it even more complex. I. I, I would I'd be drawn to that. So that was kind of the the type of work that I that I was involved in mostly and I actually never stepped on the West End stage in a big musical so um so I don't know how I managed to do that randomly because that's exactly what I trained in but yeah and so tell us about the thought process behind starting the agency like uh, what what was that moment that you kind of said right I'm going to because you must have had your own representation at the time as an actor or did you not I did I did so I had um yeah, I was really lucky when I came out of college, I had a few offers of representation and um, all were really great. And so I just went with my gut instinct um, and um, started my career with the agent at the time. Uh, he doesn't run an agency anymore, but um, great, great person, um, really, really good, sending me to all the right things. So we had a good relationship. And then after, I think it was about a year and a half after, um, there, I think he'd had some 
personal things that were going on and that he was potentially winding the agency down. And so just there was there was a communication thing where I kind of got the feeling that perhaps, perhaps he wasn't going to be able to continue running an agency. Uh, and I was right because soon so I left and, and soon after I left, um, the agency stopped running completely. Um, so anyway, I, I kind of left without another agent to go to, which I mean, I just must have been really confident at the time because I was, it was a bit of a bold move. But um, I just decided to self-represent for a little while. And I think that's kind of where I first got the inkling of I really quite enjoyed all the research involved in that. Mm. You know, finding the resources of where job opportunities might come from and kind of having to really use my own initiative on how to seek out work and make contacts with people whose work I found really interesting. Um, and this was kind of really before the days of social media being massive. I mean, now the research is easier, but but then you really had to go and seek it out. And sometimes it just wasn't really available yep. on the World Wide Web. I mean, you had to actually just go knock at some doors. Um, I mean, that makes me sound ancient. Well, I am quite ancient. But um, yeah, I, I just really enjoyed that process. So I think that was maybe the first little bubble of... I really like this. Maybe this is something I would think about for the future. And I always kind of felt like there was a bit of a business person inside me desperate to get out too. Mm. And then um, as I kind of started to research the idea of, of, of new management, I came into contact with someone who was starting an agency, um, a, a, a young lad. And um, we met up for lunch and he just had really great kind of charisma and, and passion for the industry and passion for the idea of starting an agency, you know, with, with energy and gusto, but not a whole lot of contacts and knowledge. Um, and so I don't know, I just, I just said, I'm just going to, I'll do this with you. And so we started it together and he basically fell away from it within the first few months. And I just loved it and just wanted to keep going. Uh, so, so I did. And that was, that's what happened in 2003. It's amazing. Am I right in thinking your first client is still with you? My first client is, <laughs> my first client is now the agent, is, is now director of my company and, um, and runs the Scottish office. <laughs> first client. <laughs> if anyone that doesn't realise, you have an office in London, you have an office in the north, uh, which is run by um, Anthony Williams, and then you have the Scottish office, which is run by uh, Paul Harper. So it really has from, um, you know, uh, something you started in your living room with one client who now is <laughs> um, running Scotland for you. It's really kind of uh, expanded into this kind of amazing, uh, amazing uh, branch of, uh, you know, uh, di with different locations of this agency. So amazing job well done and you work across theatre tv film commercials have I missed anything in there no not really no no that's that's accurate we kind of work across all the genres really I, that was really important to me I've always been really desperate to kind of get into all of the different sides of of um of acting for the clients and and agenting and managing them their careers and uh, not having them pigeonholed into certain parts of the industry unless they unless they desire to pigeonhole themselves of course unless they desire to really push a certain path then of course they are in charge but yeah the the um the growth of the agency has been such an interesting journey mm. Paul and I Paul who runs the Scottish office we met when I was at university and he was still at school he was 15 and I was 19 and we did an amateur dramatic production of fame together um and then uh, at university I was involved in developing a new musical there and um there was a part that was perfect for Paul so I got him involved and then we just remained friends for from there we just we stayed in touch and then when he went to drama school um up in Scotland he got in touch with me and I went to the showcase and he became my first client and that was March 2003 when I started the agency in my living room with Paul my one client and he had his first job on um the 3rd of August 2003 is when he started rehearsals for Guys and Dolls playing Nicely Nicely Johnson at the Courtyard Theatre in Hereford. 
So. Amazing, amazing. I love that. So I just want to talk a little bit about, and um, obviously um, we are in sort of slightly uncharted waters at the moment in terms of the industry um, being, I want to talk about it being on hold just at, at the moment. So can we talk about, um, we've got a couple of questions in actually that I'm going to um, pop up on the screen, but I want to talk a little bit about approaching uh, agents. So obviously in this time, a lot of agents aren't taking on new clients. Um, is this something you're doing at the moment? Uh, not, not me personally, but that's, that's actually just personally because I'm not, you know, pursuing our, our growth of my list right now. Um, yeah. But there are agents within the agency who, are who are looking at all of the graduates and um, and reaching out to them and yeah. uh, not not just graduates but people that are writing in or various mm -hmm. showcases that we have been watching. Um, so there are agents within the agency who are taking people on. I don't think there's there's probably never a time, even even in a situation like this, when all of all of us are definitely not looking for clients. There's always going to be you know our books are never completely shut. Because mm. you know, if someone is someone who's specifically unique and exciting to us in terms of our own lists comes along, then there's going to be interest there. Um, just for a jump on to Mia's question, she just put one up here. Um, we often have um, actors write to us as casting directors, and I'll talk a little bit about the difference between casting directors and agents in a minute. Uh, but write to us and say, "Oh, I keep getting told by uh, agents that they already have someone like me on the book." Um, can you just explain a little bit for people who may not understand what that means when you're saying, I, I already look after someone, you know, who is very similar to you. What, what do you mean by that as an agent? So, although that might be bad news for that specific person at that specific time, um, try and be heartened by that because most agents won't want to take on more than one person who is kind of, or won't want to take on someone who's too similar to another person in the books. Now that might be um, that they have very similar looks or very similar traits or sound alike, or um, it's some, something that just makes them go, you really remind me of this person, uh, would be a bad thing to have both of those clients on your book because they're gonna be going up for the same things. Therefore, it's quite hard. It would be quite hard to represent someone without a conflict there. Um, I mean, there's a couple of instances where that might be that might be different um, exceptional circumstances. For example, you might look after a set of twins because there might be a lot of um, opportunity for them to work together and then it maybe becomes less complicated to look after the twins. But to be honest, you know, we've actually even got an instance of that where we have a, a twin in our book and his, representative, his brother's represented by someone else. We have a really good relationship with that agent and so we actually work together really well. So. Um, yeah, I mean, also the other kind of similarity would be in terms of skills. You might have um, a really similar sound or a really similar set of skills to someone else. And so you just find that when you are going through the breakdowns um, of roles, that there's just repetitive moments when you'd be sending those two up for the same roles at the same time. And you, they might then find that they're running into each other constantly. And um, there's always instances where roles are maybe slightly, slightly more vague and that you might find other people from your agency in the audition room or in the audition waiting room. But that's that's maybe because, the, you know, the creative team aren't entirely sure exactly what type they're looking for. But you don't want to be sitting on someone's books when there is an obvious clash. It's not it's not good for you and it's not good for the other person. So to conclude, because I'm babbling a little bit. Um, it's it's a good thing, but I understand it can be slightly frustrating if you feel like it's something that you hear quite a lot when you're trying to get representation. But hold, I'd say hold out, just keep, you know, keep writing, keep working on your craft, because what, you know, what makes you unique is will make you write for the right agent, you know, that, that exactly. time of coming with the right person, it's just hard, I think, to have the rejection. Exactly. I'd absolutely say hold out, you know, because you definitely want to put yourself in, in, in the place where, you know, you're the only you on that book. Obviously, everybody is unique. Everybody's unique in, 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 in many ways. However, if you are finding that that is a repetitive thing and that you have a 
maybe a skill that's quite unusual or a, a something that's quite unusual, it might not be immediately obvious, then it's probably beneficial to make sure that that's known when you are writing in for representation. You know, like an unusual instrument or um, a, an unusual vocal range or something. I mean, I'm just picking things out of the air, but mm -hmm. make sure that the, the really unusual things about you are are put to the forefront because that might actually be the thing that, that catches someone at someone's attention and stops you from being a clash. Definitely. Um, so just coming over to uh, Mia's question, she said, good afternoon. Unfortunately, due to the current crisis, my agency had to rebrand. I consequently have lost my representation because of it. Any advice for seeking new rep? And then just tying in with that, Tamas says, uh, he's heard and read conflicting things about this. So is this an acceptable time for actors to get in touch seeking representation? I mean, I can only speak for um, ourselves and how we feel about it, but I think it's perfectly acceptable to seek representation at this time. And then there'll be some agencies who are just saying, you know, there's so much to deal with with the virus crisis that we're not taking on anyone at the moment, but most agencies aren't just one person. Most agencies are a big team of people and they'll all have different circumstances and situations. So I don't think it's gonna be, it, it, it's not gonna be disadvantageous to, to get on with seeking representation instead of sort of sitting on your hands. I would say definitely, definitely reach out to agents. Um, I would say, make sure that you research specifically which agencies you're interested in and, and go for it. I think we've said a similar thing as casting directors. We had a lot of people say, is it okay to get in touch and write in? And we've said, well, listen, honestly, there are a few things starting up at the moment. There's some film and TV starting to get going. I know there have been some face-to-face -face auditions go out on Spotlight. Um, for us right now, our clients are still just on hold. Things will start gearing up at some point. Everyone's raring to come back. So feel free to, to write to us and introduce yourself if we have to already know you or you've got a new show reel or new headshots. Um, but just know that you know, at this time, some things are on hold, some areas of the industry are on a hiatus. So just, uh, this it may sound harsh, but just don't expect a response. Know that agents and casting directors are reading your CVs and watching your showreels, but there are other things going on behind the scenes. So I don't think it's ever an inappropriate time to reach out as long as it's done in the right way. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, which brings me on to Katie's question. So just talking about approaching agents. So uh, is there anything that makes an email stand out for you when someone is seeking representation, approaching an agent? So this is a question I get asked a lot and I, I really thought about this and I actually don't know. <laughs> so sorry to not give you this magic answer, but I don't actually know what it is that stands out to me. I, it's, not, it's not some magical way of constructing an email. I mean, don't make it long. Because if we're looking at emails that are, I mean, this is just generally, this is not about whilst the virus is happening and blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. when we're looking at representation emails, we do look at them all at some point. Um, it might take us a couple of weeks to get to yours, but we do look at them all. Um, and it's really about spotting types and skills that we feel are um it is not represented on our book at the moment and where we where we sort of see a need in casting specifically you know particularly when the actor music thing really started to pick up pace and and puppeteer work started to pick up pace which was all lovely for me because I'm so passionate about that area of the industry um then uh then we would you know we would kind of really sit up and listen more at that point when people had sort of multiple instruments and they were really really great and really passionate about playing them whilst being on stage and whilst being able mm -hmm. to and being able to dance and being able to do all the other stuff um uh and similarly for the the puppetry so it it, it can it can move in shape with with new kind of genres of work coming through and, and trends, you know, there was a big physical theater movement at some point as well. I mean, that, that's kind of always around, but there was there was a big push for musical, um, physical theater coming into commercial work as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, it's, a, it's, it's actually not, it's not really about someone kind of saying something in a certain way or constructing an email in a certain way. It's actually, it's all about the person. It's all about, the person and what's what's making us kind of our ears pick up about that person. 
Something we've been talking about in our industry surgeries, and just before we go on to that, just to highlight, um, there's still so much confusion in the industry. Um, and I think some of this comes from, unfortunately, um, press and even some industry publications using terms like casting agent. Um, mm -hmm agent is somebody who looks after your career who represents you to the industry and who manages um, your career within the industry is that kind of a fair explanation yeah. and then a casting director works for the producer so we work uh, independently we are paid by the producer and our job is to work with agents to uh, find the right talent effectively to shortlist the talent uh, for the uh, production or uh, project that we're looking at and we get a lot of people write to us for representation and we don't look after anyone so the term we like to use is casting director and then you would be an agent you're also a personal manager um, Fee. Um, so know the difference. Know when you're writing to somebody. This is the biggest thing we say we're doing, the, as I said, these industry surgeries about how to present yourself to the industry uh, is know who you're writing to and know who they are and what they do. You know, writing letters to uh, dear, you know, Mr. Keddy, um, you know, uh, or dear Ord, that's that's going to create just a terrible, terrible first impression. You wouldn't believe some of the things we just get higher or forwarded emails that yeah. sent to like 100 people or even worse, all the hundred people are in the in the in the two yeah. in the top of the email. You know, a good, a really good, great agent will want to take you and look after your entire career and take you from whether it's graduation, whether it's your already an established actor, and take you through 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, I was with you as a as an actor. Uh, I think I joined you in two thousand seven, and now I'm still looked after you um, as a casting director. And that is, you know, that's the lifetime relationship. Mm -hmm you want to have um, with your agent with your client so you have to show that you've made that investment this is the biggest thing we keep saying you want that agent to take time to read the email you've put together make sure the formatting is the same make sure it hasn't got weird symbols in it because you've copied and pasted it from somewhere else but your spotlight link isn't this big but all the other text is this big and um you know just take that care and time because you are representing yourself as a business and that's the first impression that agent gets of you you know it kind of sets a tone for how you're going to be to deal with um in terms of attention to detail and timekeeping and how you're going to present yourself to a casting yeah. panel or in a rehearsal room. Um, so yeah, take that time and make that investment. Well, it's really yeah, so it's spot on. Like, I, like it's, it's, you've hit the nail on the head in so many ways there. There's so, there's so much that can be taken from receiving an email that has had no thought or bother involved. Yeah. It's just a round robin to every agent's contact details that they can find. Yeah. Um, you know, the, to whom it may concerns or oh well the agency's name is Keddy Scott Associates so presumably the person in charge is called Mr Keddy terrible assumption to make obviously for very many reasons but also <laughs> also you know even even if there wasn't a uh um even even if that wasn't offensive to me anyway um it's just you have literally not done any research at all you know when I was researching agents way back when uh there there weren't websites or anything for us to look at you know nope. they didn't have websites so you really did have to do lots of word of mouth research and still you really needed to get it right or you weren't going to get any pickup at all um but now uh, we've informative websites most agents have informative websites and there's an about us page that tells you exactly how to go about applying for <laughs> representation and it'll tell you about everybody who who uh, works under that agency, all the agents that, that are there, all the assistants, um, where they are um, location-wise, if it's an agency like us that maybe has some different offices. Um, and so to not be able to use a name or specifically target any of us or to have any idea of uh, anything about us at all, it's just, it's very, very sloppy. So your point in that, Obviously, the idea the, the 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 idea in an ideal world is that you get together with an agent where that becomes a lifelong um, partnership together because that's what it is. It's a partnership. There's no hierarchy there. There's no you're the boss of me or I'm the boss of you. It's about we work together to achieve the success that we want to get together, and that's exciting for both of us. It's your career and it's my career. Um, then. You need to show that you are specifically excited about that agent. So 
if you are writing to me and and I think, oh my gosh, this person's really interesting with me. Like I really, I really love that performance. It's really, really resonated with me. There's something really special. For me, there's something really special about this person. And I pursue that and we start a conversation. You come in and we meet and I see a bit more of your work and we got on really well and there's great chemistry there. You need to be just as excited about me as I am about you. And that's what creates that fantastic, that fantastic relationship that's more likely to go for years and years that we have to, you know, no matter what, have trust in each other, that sometimes we won't agree on absolutely everything, but that's okay because we talk about it and we, we make decisions together. That's how the whole thing works. And the minute that that isn't the case, the minute that that starts to break down is when the relationship maybe isn't going so well and maybe, maybe you know, a new relationship needs to be found or, um, or, or maybe you're not the client for us because you don't seem to... You know, you're maybe only going to accept representation because what we're the only people that have offered you. Like, that's not a reason to go with someone. Although I understand that it's tempting if you just really want to be represented and you've got one offer. I understand that, but I think it's better to hold out. I think it's important to know that for that great, successful, long relationship that will develop a successful career path for you, it's got to be a two-way thing. I think one other thing that we say a lot and it's about this investment that we talk about is you keep saying, and I remember it very well, that, you know, there weren't all these websites available. There weren't, you know, um, you know, Spotlight wasn't online. We had to go and buy contacts and Spotlight was a book um, that you got your picture. Well, it still is, but that was that was the way to do it. And I remember writing off for, for um, castings that I'd seen and, uh, the stage or um, uh, cast web and uh, actually printing off a letter, getting a 10 by 8 photograph, which I'd got from that place um, behind uh, Bond Street, and yeah. uh, well, Oxford Street, and, you know, you kind of yeah. see you're being looking at your, and printing off your 10 by 8 and going, oh, my God, you know, it's like half a week's rent, printing off my 100 10 by 8s and then putting them in an envelope and putting a stamp on and writing it to the casting director. And we always say, like, don't make how, don't let how easy that's become can't make us lazy in yeah. just kind of like, oh I can just shoot an email off like do your research take the same amount of time we always say if you're writing to an agent or a casting director it should be 20 minutes of your time to go through and change what you know what it is you're going to talk about your passion for that agent or you know what what skills you might be highlighting depending on who you're writing to or what experience you have or you know, what clients do you know that they've already looked after and so just take that take that time I think um it's a very long answer from us both to um her question <laughs> uh in terms of um your clients approaching casting directors we get asked a lot of people mind writing to us and we always say um we do a lot of uh, quite uh, unusual projects where sometimes for us just putting a spotlight breakdown out uh, either isn't enough or we need people with very specific skills so we very much open up a lot of our castings to uh people that are unrepped or even people who have representation to just drop us a line and say hi but some agents don't like uh, their clients to be making contact outside their relationship with that casting director what are your thoughts on that how do you feel about your clients approaching casting directors um, that can well that can differ I mean, we don't. It's not like we feel like our toes have been stood on or anything like that. So it's not. It's not with that in mind. It's actually more that um, we do try to protect the casting directors to an extent. Um, and and when I say protect, that's not because you know you actors are all bad people. It's because I think you know there's obviously the natural thing whereby it's harder to be subjective when you're submitting yourself. Yeah. Um, and also that casting directors are, and this is something that is said by all of my casting director friends all the time completely inundated with submissions when it when they're limiting it even just to um their their list of agents that they trust never mind if that's if that's opened up um that said you know there are uh, lots of amazing actors and artists out there who are unrepresented and yeah. would be able to access casting as well so um i mean i guess that I'm kind of going off point there because that's that's not somebody reaching out to a casting director who's represented by me. Mm. Um, but I do feel that casting directors also need to be able to um, give actors access to them is, is my point because, you know, we can't let that huge number of people who are unrepresented not be able to 
seek the work themselves. Yeah. Um, what I would say is I think I think that the process of, of um, actors represented by agents being submitted to casting directors is generally in place because it's it's a it's just a series of vetting, isn't it? You know, we we know our artists really well, we know their skills, we should know our, their skills really well, understand them as people as well. Um, so try and work out where, um, and also understand what their desires are in their career, obviously, the most important part. And so trying to um, put them into the room or <laughs> into the Zoom room right now um, mm -hmm. with casting directors for projects that they would be really excited about, parts they're really desperate to go after. Um, and and casting directors where there's a creative team that you feel that that, that, that actor is going to, fit really well with too if if you have as much knowledge uh, not all the time but you know with some creative teams you will kind of have that much in-depth knowledge and so that process is there to try and help the casting director to do that kind of very first shortlist mm -hmm. and also, you know your level of relationship with that casting director will hold a level of um knowledge and respect and trust so you know, if you're sending them a certain person and you're saying, I really think this person's going to be a great candidate for you for this role, you've never met them before and I'd love for you to meet them, then um, then that, that can be taken on a different level of seriousness because of that relationship, that relationship that has been garnered over many, many years uh, in most cases. So that is really why that process is important and in place because otherwise casting directors, there's just no way that casting directors could possibly review and respond and see the numbers of submissions that they get for every single project that they do. There has to be a way to bring those numbers down um, and we're part of that process. Um, but that said, casting directors do have something and it's maybe very, very unusual or for some reason, they just really want to open it out. Let's say that's in their hands if they if they're putting something public out there and they do want to hear from um, actors directly. I have no problem with any actors getting in touch, but we obviously we want to be in the loop with it because we are part of that team. So you know, regardless of whether someone um, sort of comes to me and says, "Oh, I've got an audition uh, on Thursday with Pearson Casting," I'm like, "Great, great." So just copy me on the information, um, just so that we're abreast of everything that's happening with you are a client because we're, we're part of it. We're part of the team. So, And I think that is the, the twofold thing. I think, first of all, we always say, you know, a number of people write, because we have kind of quite an open door policy, um, people will often write and say, oh, I don't know if my agent submitted me yet on Spotlight. Well, that's a conversation you have to have had with your agent before you contact. Otherwise, all you are doing is just doubling up on the workload uh, for us. Um, yeah, so uh, what was the point you just made then? Uh, oh yes, okay, so sometimes it's going to be a no for you as an actor. And that, that conversation might be a delicate one. Um, there might be a hundred reasons why you might not be right for this production you don't necessarily understand at this point. I might need to pick up the phone and say, hi, Fee, it's going to be a no this time because we'll see them again in six months. So mm -hmm. it kind of does undermine that relationship if you then start writing every week saying, I don't know why you won't see me. So sometimes you have to trust. Your agent wants you to work. Your agent wants you to be in that production. And trust me, if there's yeah. an opportunity to pick the phone up and push and get you in the room, they have done that for you already. So um, I think sometimes people get in touch a little bit with this, not your clients, but sometimes we get a bit of a, oh, I don't know if my agent submitted, but I just really need you to understand that I'm really right for this production. And that conversation may already have happened with that agent. And we have relationships that maybe actors aren't party to sometimes, sometimes to protect them and sometimes to protect the agency. So it kind of, you know, sometimes just trust that your agent is working for you and wants the best for you. That's that's really it from, from our perspective. Yeah, um, that should definitely be true. <laughs> it should definitely be true. <laughs> Should be true, yeah. Um, so I've got quite a few questions. I have a couple of things I want to ask you first. So I think um, obviously pre the current crisis, um, you know, life has definitely, I think, got a lot more um, intense. So I'm going to say that potentially for actors uh, living and working in London, certainly um, when I was a jobbing actor in London, things were expensive. Um, but now I think life is more expensive. And I think striking that work-life balance and the day job versus the audition is probably harder than it's ever been which I know uh, 
for example, James and I are incredibly conscious of. How? What's your advice to actors in terms of striking that balance? And and do you think that that has become harder for for actors to 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 have, to be able to survive in London? I'm saying making it London centric because it is so much more expensive. I think outside London, and I've lived in Liverpool as well, working as a creative as an, an actor, and it is a lot easier um, to provide yourself with a, a living and an income. Um, so, what are your thoughts on that? Um. So yeah, you're right. It's it's always hard. That's. <laughs> It's, it's almost half of, of the ability to be successful, I think, as an artist, is, is how you handle yourself in your non-acting side of your life. Um, so putting COVID aside for a second, mm. hopefully, hopefully soon for good, um, I would say it's, it's one of the most important things that you can strike that balance. And that's not easy. And some people are very natural at finding it and doing it and some people really struggle with it and it can be the thing that ends your career in the arts because it can become too much but finding the job the flexible job that you can come and go from that earns you a decent living that you don't dread going to that you quite enjoy actually mm -hmm. um, when you're in and out of acting work that is the gold dust. That's the magical answer that you, that I would make a big priority to find right at the beginning and, and then never let it go. Um, it's really hard. There's no two ways about it, but the, the issue is, is that everybody is in that same boat. And so it's important that you can get that established um, because if you don't work hard at that, then you're going to come across those pitfalls. Um, you might be really lucky in that quite quickly after graduation, you land something amazing really quickly, which is awesome. But then you're probably going to find it even harder when you have to come mm -hmm. bump into earth and then, and then uh, understand what all of your college mates have been experiencing since they came out of college or, or, or not even out of college. Just um, you know, not everybody goes to drama school, of course. Um, so I think I think it's a really big important thing to place quite often when we are um, having a, an interview with a, a potential actor who may be joining our books it's something that we talk about you know what do you do when you're not acting how flexible is it um, how how uh, comfortable does that make you mm. we try to help and make suggestions of, of places that we know that other people have worked before or 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 where someone might be a bit more happy or types of work that they can maybe try to explore. We do try to help with that sort of stuff. But then there is a level where we have to relinquish our responsibility on that side as well, because we're really, really busy looking after your career and trying to find you the opportunities in acting as well. So there is a point, obviously, we'll always be happy to assist in every way that we can and, and give you contacts in that way if we can. But you've got to take that onus upon yourself and be a big, bad grown up about it. Um, and and take that responsibility away from us. And what I mean by that is when we call with great auditions for you is to not be having to rearrange that time or ask casting directors to um, switch days because you can't get out of your um, hustle job. Uh, and that sounds really harsh, but that's actually just us trying to protect you and the, uh, you know, you're going to have more opportunities if we're not constantly saying this person needs to change time, this person needs to change time, because the, the eventual message that that does give to casting directors, unfortunately, whether it's true or not, is that these auditions are not your priority and this job is. And again, that sounds so harsh because we all have to live, we all have to pay the rent, and that's really hard in London. Um, but at the moment, that is just. That's just what needs to be done. So um, moving on to the current crisis, yes, mm -hmm. I would say there's an element of my advice that flips a little bit here now, where I'd say right now you need to look after yourself. You need, you need to look after your um, at-home situation, your friends, your family, your finances, your body and your mind, um, those I mean, all of those things are always really your first priority. Let's, you know, let's be clear about that. But right now, those have to be your time priority as well. You yeah. know, so actually, and you know what? Auditions that are going to come your way right now, if if any do, they're mostly going to be tapes. They're mostly going to be online situations. So those are 
you can control those better. So you're not going to be asked to, you know, cut work in the middle of the day and get to the other side of town to do something at the last minute. So take this time to actually really try to, if you can, um, look after yourself, look after your loved ones, and um, and and do lots of learning if you have that opportunity. I mean, thanks to this platform, you know, you have that opportunity every day. And and I would say that that's that during this period when things really are kind of on hold and in hibernation, then that's the time to just really focus on that. Um, we are hopefully now starting to see a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. And so those, uh, the, the feeling towards that needs to sort of slightly move and switch over the coming months. But um, but yeah, I don't know if I just waffled a bit more or if that was no, it. No, no, completely. But I think exactly as you're saying, it's not going to be a light that suddenly switches back on and we're back to, you know, yeah several hundreds of productions auditioning a week um so you know perhaps in if you have something at the moment that's um you know a survival job that you enjoy on some level you know maybe take this time as as v says to kind of you know do do the things that you've said for years you don't have time to do regular yoga or meditation and take time a little bit for yourself so that when this comes back that transition you feel a little bit more in control of it um yeah. Definitely. Um, I've got some much more articulate. <laughs> That's exactly what I meant. I just did all the bits you said and then made them on my own. Um, I've got a few questions. Um, Nicole says, do agents prefer performers who've been to drama school? Oh, no, not necessarily at all. Gosh, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, I've never thought of, I just wouldn't think of it. I don't prefer any particular drama school. I don't prefer that someone has been to drama school. I've got quite a few clients who haven't been to drama school. Um, some people just don't and can't. And everybody has very different situations in their lives. Mm -hmm. that, said, that said, drama schools are excellent, you know, to have that to have that formal training is, is great and a gift and a huge privilege. Um, but it's, it's definitely not essential. There's lots of ways to learn your craft. You may learn your craft in work. It might be more difficult to, the start of that journey might be more difficult, it might be more difficult to come into contact with agents and casting directors and um, platforms where there's job opportunities. All of those things are maybe because drama school may introduce people to those things. And obviously there's the technical training involvement as well, but, but in short, I have no preference. Um, I have I clients who have not done any training at all, not been to university, not done any kind of training um, and are superb artists. I think it's the same from a casting perspective. We look at the talent first, but if you can utilize the tools that you have around you, if you can get good and like Fee says, use platforms like this where we've got free sessions on like self-taping, creating showreels, doing voiceovers, um, not that these are to replace formal training, but then you can use the tools that you have to say, I've got a show reel together, or at least I can take monologues or, you know, um, whatever it is to show your craft and your talent to potential agents and to casting directors. Um, use those platforms to, yeah, show show us what you have. And I don't think necessarily training or a CV is the be all and end all um, for anyone. Um, Sanjay has a two-part question. He says, I wanted to ask when the industry isn't writing for South Asian roles, which leads to lack of opportunities, how can we get representation, representation to grow our careers? Um, we'll start with that one. Um, so a, a lack of roles in um, for Asians, yes. I mean, that's definitely true. Uh, what I would first off recommend is is to um if if you're so inclined is to start writing get writing you know we need we need people to start writing stories um that that represent everyone on screen and on stage uh to tell to tell those stories and then to present those stories too um so i think if we are lacking content then we need people to just really commit to writing that content um, I wouldn't have thought that there would be, I mean, perhaps you are having difficulty being represented and I'm really sorry to hear that, um, but it certainly wouldn't be a situ an issue for, for us at all. We don't think actually that there's a lack of 
Asian roles um, or, or non-Asian roles that would be cast by any ethnicity in our breakdowns. Um, I think that there's a long road that we're on and I think that we're making progress and I think that there's more to learn and there's more to do and it's there's still a long way to go but I think that there is opportunity for you out there and I would say don't feel don't feel um, disheartened by that just keep pushing forward um, if you believe in yourself and believe in your talent then tell us and keep pushing forward you know I think there's a lot out there for everyone. Exactly as we said earlier, Sanjay, the things that you may find difficult now are the things that make you unique, that you know, there are roles out there for you. And I think it's something we've been talking about a lot um, over the past few um, Q&A sessions here at um, CCI with different casting directors, um, as well as the responsibility of uh, producers and casting teams now to make everything just more accessible um you know there's why is there any reason why specific roles have to be played by specific ethnicities in terms yeah. of let's open let's let's have these conversations now this is the time for us all to take accountability and say well actually why does there's no reason why this role has to be played by a caucasian person mm -hmm. let's open this up and let's have these conversations so i think although not enough has been done the conversation is is being had and we're all looking at how we can improve this across the industry so trust that we know that we haven't done enough yet but we're working to do more um and just as fee says just just stay in there just keep keep at it and stay positive and you know believe in yourself and the skills that you have um that make you incredibly valuable um you know um Good. So Tom says, any advice? This is a really uh, popular question for 2020 grads who have potentially lost agency showcases and might be self-represented for a while. Would you recommend contacting agents independently? Yes, definitely contact agents independently. Um, for sure. I, 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 obviously, I don't know where you've trained, um, so I don't know what showcase you might have lost. I know that schools are doing lots of different things. Some schools are doing online showcases. Some are, are doing all of their um, students are doing self tapes that are then being either put in an online platform or emailed to the agent separately. Um, some people are just doing that independently of themselves. Some showcases are being pushed back later in the year. So those will still actually happen in person or live to some extent. Um, so obviously I don't know which of those I'm going to assume that yours isn't doing anything at all, uh, just just because obviously the the question. So I would just say I get, get some stuff down. If you don't have a showreel, get some stuff down as a self tape, and and send that out because you can write to agents, but they're going to need to have seen a little bit of your work to um you know to to see how you act. So I would just get a couple of scripts, maybe a couple of contrasting types of roles that you think you're quite suitable for and put a good self tape together and send that out. That's that's the best thing I can recommend. But but I'd, I'd say that graduates are actually getting decent, generally decent exposure actually, because the agents and the casting directors are at home. Um, some, you know, some are uh, temporarily redundant whilst the lockdown is happening and we're all in sort of hibernation. So actually there, there is time to review things you might find that you your tape gets watched a lot, a lot more than it would do if times were normal. So um, so don't be afraid to push your stuff out there and you're not going to lose anything by sending your stuff out too. So definitely, definitely be proactive and, and get your stuff out. I think something we say a lot as well at the moment um, through various Q&As and a lot of grads obviously feeling uh, stressed this year about you know, not feeling that they have that visibility. And I think like Fee says, you absolutely do. And we're very aware of you and colleges have been amazing about sending out material and Dropbox links and filming or delaying um, showcases. But just know that you're not on your own. This isn't something that just happened to you or your college or all the new grads, but everyone in the industry is still working. Everything has stopped for everybody. So when we come out the other side of this, you're still the new grads and we're still gonna want to meet you and bring you into the rooms and, you know, agents are, taking um you know new grads on and so when this all comes back it's going to come back as if it just 
we press the pause button. It's not like, you know, we've all been involved in productions where, you know, something collapses and then you're the one kind of going, oh my God, everything has collapsed, but you know, everyone else is doing great. This isn't, this isn't one of those situations. And literally every single person in the industry is in exactly the same boat. And so just have faith that it's going to come back and we're all absolutely raring to go and to get it back up on its feet. So just know that this is a pause button for everyone, Tom, and not just for you. Absolutely, a pause button. That's exactly what it is. Uh, Anna says, hi, Rosie and Fiona. Is it okay to email two agents in the same agency if you've done research and believe both will be a great match for you, although that'd be a big no-no smiley face? <laughs> um, I mean, this might be a personal answer, but personally, I don't see why not. I don't see why you can't do that. If, like you say, if you've researched um, the agents within that agency and you think that both could potentially be a good fit for you, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Why not? Why not? Uh, Rachel says, hello, Rosie and Fiona. In regards to names and addressing agents, casting directors, would you say the use of first names is too informal? Would you appreciate the familiarity that could come with it? I'll let you answer that first. Uh, I'd always say first names. Uh, for me, yeah, I'd find it really odd to be called Mrs. Ord. <laughs> Mr. Kidd. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's not a formal enough industry. Mm. We're, we're quite an informal industry in that way. And when I think of casting directors, I, I, I'm fairly sure they're, they'd feel the same, that it would be a first name thing. So, yeah, I'm not even going to bandy around with that. I'd say first names. Do you agree? I 100%. I do like a dear Rosie. I don't really like, yeah. like, I mean, I don't mind, but you know, hiya. And I think, you know, there is an element of, yes, whilst this is a very kind of relaxed, informal interview where everyone works on a first name basis, you're still kind of uh, still presenting yourself for the first time. So, yeah. you know, and yeah, yeah, first names, or I think always first names. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, Yvonne says, hi, Fiona. I'm unable to join Spotlight due to not having enough credits. Any suggestions when approaching agents or CDs for representation? Should I send a self-tape? Yes, yes, Yvonne, that's exactly what you should do. Um, yeah, it's really tricky. I mean, Spotlight, Spotlight? Spotlight have to have that in place uh, because, again, they've got to have some way of, of vetting the membership, and that doesn't always work um correctly obviously there are going to be some amazing artists that will fall through that crack and then find it really difficult to approach agents um but i would say that I, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be off-putting to me at all to have an application from someone who is not on spotlight um that's not something that that kind of says to me well this actor is good or not good it's just this actor is just not on spotlight it's quite simple um I always think that if you want to demonstrate your abilities, you know, with the technology that we have now, you simply just put yourself on tape and you send that out. You can send a normal uh, drawn up Word document or PDF CV as well. That's fine. Um, but actually, the first thing I'd probably look at would be a demonstration of your skills, which would be a, a showreel or, or a self tape. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, if I sort of go, oh, really interesting, then I'm going to have a look at your CV. But to be honest, by that point, I'm probably a bit sold. It's more about what you can do and less about where have you come from, where have you trained, what have you done so far. I mean, those things are interesting just in me learning about the person, but not in deciding whether I'm interested in you or not. I think the same same for casting director. Well, same. I know I'm going to speak for everyone. Same for us. Um, you know, we say this a lot, but if you are on Spotlight, this is a platform that you pay for, so use it. Get clips on there. The first thing I do yeah. if I'm looking through submissions, I'm sure Fee does the same thing. If someone writes in with a Spotlight link, is to click straight away on the footage. It doesn't matter whether it's an acting show, real dance, vocal, whatever it is. I want to see. I want to see what you look like. Get an idea of your skill set, your range as a performer, what you look like on camera, if that's relevant. Um, um, so again, yes, if you're writing off to casting directors or to agents, always, always, always send good quality footage because it speaks volumes above credits for, for us, certainly. Um, you know, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, Helen says, hello, I've been working uh, from, for my own theatre company for four years. I'm seeking an agent. I'm Scottish and disabled. Have you any advice about where to start and should my disability feature? Um, interestingly, Phil, I'm sure you know this, but we have the lovely Amy Conican on the other day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, in Hollyoaks. So, uh, yeah, if, I didn't know if you'd uh, I'd mentioned that she came on, but I'll let you start with this one. 
Oh, I need, yeah, I need to go back and actually watch Amy. Yeah, love her. Um, uh, should your disability feature? I'm sorry, I'm not really sure what you mean by that. As in, I think it's, I think you you can talk about it, <laughs> of course. Um, but uh, but it but it won't make any difference. It, it, won't, it won't decipher whether someone wants to represent you or not represent you. If that's if that's what you mean, I'm not really sure. Um, but that's really cool that you've been running your own theatre company. Well done. That's the height of proactive <laughs> proactive work. Um, so bravo, hats off to you. Um, and I would say there's probably not really any different way to write to the agents. So just just tell them about the work that you've been doing. Tell them about what you're um, what you want to do, what you're passionate about, where you would like to go, why you think you'd be a good fit within that agency, what it is about that agency that that makes you want to write to them so it's not really a different story because of because of what you said in your question it's just just the same yeah perfect um laura says any advice you can give for eu actors or oh, when getting signed and whether this affects agents and their want to sign uh, I think, Laura, I think you're talking potentially about the um, Britain leaving the EU at the end of the year. Um, I might just wait for you just to come back um, and just clarify on that. But it, do you mean uh, in terms of their ability to work in the UK? Um, I'm just asking that if I just take your question off and you just pop in the comments box, if you just be a little um, clearer potentially on what the question is uh, for Fiona and we'll come back to that one. Um, uh, oh, uh, um, Nicole from earlier says, thanks. Uh, she hasn't been to drama school. She hasn't been to any of the major schools and she does have spotlight learnt on the job mostly. Uh, Lorna says, hi, Rosie and Fiona. What's your opinion on actors doing SA work? I believe it's a great chance to get familiar with sets and the way filming is done. However, I've heard agents aren't fond of this. Yes, that's a really good question. Um, again, it will be a personal thing. It will be down to opinion. But, but my answer is if you want to work in TV and film, it's not such a great idea um, because um because if we're trying to get you seen for acting roles it may be tricky if you're then appearing on because you know there's lots of long-running dramas and shows out there if you're appearing as a, a supporting artist then that's going to get in the way of us trying to get you seen for actual acting roles but your point is really valid it does give you a bit of experience on on what to expect on set and how things go like you know just the order of things and how it all works on there because you know that's that is valuable experience so i guess i guess you can maybe somewhat make a call on it you certainly wouldn't put it on your cv i wouldn't advise and you may um do maybe do a few days if you get offered on on something that you would never be um trying to get a a part on uh, and then just don't really talk about it don't make it known don't make a thing of it maybe you know do you know what I mean I just I think if you're if you want to pursue the acting on screen pursue the acting on screen it's 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 background work at the end of the day sometimes you can get a bit lucky it's really hard because sometimes you can get a bit lucky and you know one of the ad's gives you a line or a couple of lines and then it ends up being quite a nice little acting role but you know that's very unusual it's not uh, it's not really a good way to to get your first tv gig so i'd say if you're with a good agent and you're working really well together just put your faith in that relationship and and you'll make it happen hold out um, just coming back to Laura's question, so she's saying yes, definitely referring to Brexit. So, uh, how is that working for you at the moment? In terms, of, obviously, there's still so much that's unknown because we don't have yeah. trade deals in place yet. So, uh, oh, she's yeah. again. A lot of people have been allowed to get residency for the next five years post graduation. Does this affect decisions agents will take in terms of their clients possibly not working? Again, I can only answer personally, uh, but personally, at the moment, it's not affecting any of our decisions. No um uh because it's completely unknown we don't know what's going to happen we don't know how that's going to play out so for now it's just it's just business as usual in terms of the eu um moving forward it would only affect things in a logistical way it wouldn't it wouldn't affect things you know it wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't look at an artist that we've just fallen in love with and and really want to represent because there's complications involved in that you know we would 
hopefully try and help to resolve that too. But yes, it makes it a bit more complicated for you. Here's hoping that it's just a bit simple and straightforward. So that's what, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of really pinning my hopes on that, that it's not going to be complicated, that we're going to have yeah. freedom of movement and it's all going to be okay. <laughs> Same, and we work with a lot of uh, overseas clients. Um, we work with a big one, uh, which is based in Europe, but finding uh, specifically uh, British talent for them. And at the moment, the, the word is, absolutely go ahead as we are and then we'll cross any visa bridges when they come to it at the end of the day i'm hoping like fee said just speaking for myself but i'm really hoping that these um the what each country gains from allowing people to work freely like this within the eu even if we don't have freedom of movement as we've understood it now even if there's some sort of small fee to pay or some kind of visa process that will be kept as simple and straightforward as possible because we only benefit from being able to have access to yeah. European talent here and British talent in Europe so hopefully they'll come to some kind of uh, agreement which doesn't make this uh, too complicated Laura says thank you so much for that there are a few more questions but I don't want to run out of time because we only have 25 minutes left unbelievably so I just want to talk very briefly about um, starting an agency so right at the beginning of this you said um, you know obviously this was kind of blood sweat and tears your baby and you kind of did this by yourself literally grassroots to this incredible company that it is now so if there are actors out there or anyone really uh, in the industry who's looking to start an agency uh what what words of advice do you have for them um uh it depends on the motivations of, of starting an agency uh, to be brutally honest if it comes from a, a, a feeling, uh, maybe a strong feeling, that you really want to be an agent, then go for it because um, it's an amazing job. I love my job so much, but it's really hard. And there, you know, if you think you get knockbacks as an actor, you get hundreds and thousands of knockbacks as an agent because you take knockbacks on behalf of all of your clients uh you know you ride that roller coaster with with everybody that you represent but um but you also take knockbacks as an agent as you're building through your career you know when people don't really know about you yet and you're sort of really trying to build that part of it it's it's very very tricky and that's not because people are unkind um or untrusting it's not a personal thing it's just you've just got to do your time and and um and pay your dues if that makes sense you can't just you can't just kind of appear in the scene and expect to be suddenly taken seriously and and expect to have access to all the information as it, it's not it's not a right so you have to really know that you want to do it and then you have to really 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 love it to stay at it because it it will test you lots and lots of times. Also, just the nature of the job as an agent is that you can take quite a lot of, um, you have to have a lot of very difficult conversations on behalf of kind of everyone. You're basically this sort of strange middle person. Um, and most of the decisions that are made that affect outcomes are not actually yours. At the end of the day, they, you're instructed to do them, but they're not, but they're not your decisions. So whatever the outcome is, if it's euphoric or if it's fury, <laughs> then that's going to land on your shoulders. Um, and you have to have the ability to separate your feelings from that and not take that home with you and not um, and not get bogged down with it. Or um, yeah, it's just it's a real roller coaster. But it's 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 a fantastic fantastic career. So I would always encourage anybody who thinks they might be interested to to find out more and maybe you know apply for some internships or assisting jobs it's as if you read christopher's mind he literally just wrote are there opportunities generally for an intern star relationship after lockdown oh i think that's to you Fee. i'm trying to get experience uh -huh. to help me more help me get more versatile thank you for being here by the way so oh, um, that's nice um you're welcome thank <laughs> you for having me um, I, I the answer is I don't know. 
I don't know if we're going to be in the same office right now. There's so much unknown for us at the moment. You know, we will be there fighting strong. And we're, that's for sure. But, um, but what that's going to look like at the moment, I can't, I can't tell you for sure that, that we might change the way that we work and the locations that we work, or, or we might not. We might go right back to what we were doing before. I have, I have to wait and see how things play out how the, the TV and film sector picks up, which is starting, starting to maybe slightly ease at the moment. Theatre is a different story. Again, you know, we're seeing little rays of light and then and then the, some bad news comes along. So it's really unknown for me at the moment. And, and that, that means that I wouldn't be considering anything like internships in the near future. Um, that said, the other unknown is that lockdown could be eased. The, vaccina the vaccination could be found everything is reversed we go back to work and there's a huge surge of activity and we are in a position to maybe be able to host an internship the thing to always remember about an internship is it's actually not as much as it can sound like you're coming along to uh, sort of offer very very low cost assistance an internship is actually a lot of work for the place that you're interning for because Generally, you know, we wouldn't want to hand any actual work over to an intern. The intern is there to learn, to to get a feel and understand things. And so to make an internship worthwhile for anybody, then we would be trying to um, give you an education and teach you and um, give you insight. But also we have to be exceptionally discreet because there is information that happens in an agent's office that is not for outside ears. And so only the agents involved and the team involved can really be dealing with that. So we'd have to be very careful about what things are discussed in in the presence of an intern. So it, it's quite a complicated thing and it doesn't relieve us of work. It actually costs us work. So it's quite a commitment but it's not something that I definitely wouldn't consider in the future. It's just not something I can really think about right now, unfortunately. Exactly the same for us, actually. We've had a lot of people write saying, you know, during this time I've been thinking about moving into casting, so you know, that's amazing, but, you know, we have someone that we had as an intern uh, really working right up until all this happened, and we kind of have her on hold. And if an opportunity comes up, obviously we'll go to someone who's kind of put that time in, but, yes, it's not um, it's not a, an, an unpaid assistant job, and as you say, um, fee very often people write and say I'd love to do running well even running in an audition room you're party potentially to really sensitive information so we have to be very careful about who comes in and who's going to be discreet and who has the right kind of energy for the room so uh, sometimes it can be just more complicated than saying yeah just you know pop into the office and hang out for a couple of weeks um, yeah. Much yeah. as we love doing that, it is it, as Fee says, it is a massive investment um, on the part of the people offering the internship. But they they will be available, and things will come up. So hold tight, definitely. Yeah, you know, I do get it, and it is it is the way to get a bit of insight. But I do get this sort of uh, how how exciting it would be to be a fly on the wall in in a in a room where you don't you, you wonder what the conversations might be. Um, but also to be a f the reason that it would be really, really interesting to be a fly in the wall is because those conversations actually are are really sensitive and really discreet, and that you know we have we have personal information of all of our actors and ourselves and our way of working that we have to we have to keep discreet. We've we've made a commitment to keep that discreet and to, to be professional about that. So um, yeah, so it's just a little bit more complex. That's all. And so this is a bit of a tricky question, but what do you think could be the pitfalls and forget the COVID crisis? Let's say someone wants to launch um, an agency and they want to do it next year. Things are up and moving again. Let's assume the industry is going back to some kind of normality. What are the pitfalls to avoid in the first 12 months for you of starting an agency as someone who did that very successfully? Um... The pitfall, I mean, the, the, the biggest pitfall is, um, is, is access to information because there's no, there's no magic answer to that. There's no fast track to it. That builds over years. So I'm talking about casting information. Mm. Access to casting information builds over many, many years. And you can't have it overnight. And you, can't, you, you might have a buddy who's a casting director who will definitely put you on their best and first casting list but that will just be from that one casting director and there are so many out there and there's so many producers and that you know that's just this country um going out with that because we work internationally as well going out with that it's just a whole other ball game so this this 
There is no quick way to do that. So that is your first and biggest and will always be your biggest pitfall. And that will exist and frustrate you for many, many years. And as I kind of touched on earlier, it should. Because for all of those people who have taken years and years, and you know, we're one of them, years of time to build those up and build them, you know, with integrity and um and honesty, then you don't just want any new kid on the block to just come in and suddenly have access to all that to be able to because also you just don't really have the experience to make the right calls on those things um so yeah so it's right that it takes that time so that's I think you need to you need to understand from yourself that it's going to take a long time and if you're comfortable with that if you if you're really that hell-bent on doing it then um then then it is the right choice for you um and you just need to buckle down and get comfortable pushing, constantly pushing, constantly asking, please, please let me see, please put me on your list, please see my clients for. Always knocking on that door, but always <laughs> knocking on that, that door. door. That never stops. <laughs> always knocking on your door saying, please see my clients for. <laughs> um, Christopher, who asked about the internship, said, oh, I completely understand my high school teacher as well. Thank you for answering. He understands about the discretion side. A couple of, so just going back to Helen Fox, who is um, the Scottish uh, actor who uh, has started her own theatre company. She has an invisible disability. There are agents who represent disabled performers. Would that be a better focus? Would it put you off because I have limitations? I think I know what the answer to this is going to be. Um, I think from a casting perspective, um, before Fee Speaks as an agent, absolutely not. It will never, ever put us off um, that someone has any kind of disability. In fact, we were discussing with Amy Conaghan a little bit, um, like we were kind of uh, talking uh, loosely with Sanjay as well, that we just need to just be much more uh, open and inclusive. Uh, we've worked with so many producers who just say, well, OK, um, you know, we have an actor who's phenomenal, but they have some sight impairment. Right. Okay. What does that mean in terms of um, in terms of the rehearsal process? Because they have no peripheral vision. Great. Okay. So let's just map that out and then we move on. It's not. It will never. Um, it for in my experience be an impediment for you um, to be able to access a job or to become into auditions um, because of any disability you have. And that's point blank discrimination. Uh, as Fee said, sometimes there are exceptions to things. For example, if you want to work on cruise ships, um, you are a crew member first. So before you're a performer, you absolutely have to be able to service uh, that ship in terms of your safety responsibilities. Um, you know, if something goes wrong, you need to be able to work a lifeboat. You need to have, uh, you know, good enough vision, at least with a pair of glasses. You need to be fully abled enough that you can physically help that ship because there are laws um, by which there are a certain number of people passengers on board versus certain number of crew members. So unfortunately, there are lots of, we all go through extensive medicals uh, when you work on ships and there are lots of reasons why you may not be able to be hired because your first and foremost uh, responsibility is to the safety of the ship. So there are limitations sometimes around what we're able to offer. I knew a dancer who broke their finger once on a ship and was sent home for two weeks, not because they couldn't dance the show or because it any visibly you know, impacted anything at all, but because they physically weren't able to perform their lifeboat uh, rigging duty uh, that was involved and that was their first and foremost responsibility so sometimes there are um, very exceptional limitations over why somebody couldn't be offered a role I mean Amy Conaghan we uh, referred to a couple of times is a wheelchair user and is an actor in Hollyoaks and she said obviously there are limitations in old theatres or rehearsal spaces where they're listed buildings and we they can't put ramps or lifts in so she said you know, obviously I have to, and my agent and the casting team and the producers have to be aware that there are limitations based around the fact that I need to be in my wheelchair in order to access a stage. Um, and so sometimes there are limitations outside our control, but in terms of, in my experience, coming to a perform with any kind of uh, disability, that would never be an impediment for them to be able to come in and audition for, for a role. And I think, um, you know, we were talking the other day about, you know, let, let's just open this whole conversation up to be talking much more um, inclusively about what does that mean? What, you know, what elements do we have to include in an audition room or a rehearsal room or in a, in a working space uh, to accommodate, whether it's a mental health, um, 
you know, uh, issue that someone is dealing with or whether it's uh, uh, some kind of, like you say, some kind of disability or something that limits you either physically or psychologically um, to be able to work around um, people. I've talked yeah. a lot. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. And also I was just muting myself in between because also my family are making racket outside the door. So, um, uh, so yeah, if you hear any, like, I've got you hear it, yeah. I'm noisy. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So, uh, in, in in bold answer to your question, no, it wouldn't put us off. It's it's not uh, it's not about that because it's because it's a little bit more complicated to you know organise certain things. No, that's not a problem at all. There's it, it, we have many actors with many specific limitations just in life that mean that it's not straightforward. There's not just you know that we can't just put them up for certain jobs because of you know their own personal limitations. That's not a problem at all. We deal with limitations always um, and um, you know we've got we've got a range of clients we've got some physical disability we've got you know neurodiverse it's it's actually something where you know if, if it's something that our artist is comfortable telling us and talking to us about then we can then deal with the practicalities of that and if we are allowed to if we are allowed to disclose that information you know with their um permission onto um the casting process or the producer once that person has been cast then we can solve any practical elements that might be involved there but we'd certainly expect things to just be solved we wouldn't expect any different kinds of treatment. I'm sure that's not always been the case, but I certainly would expect that to be the case now. And I would, um, I would ferociously push, push back if it wasn't. So, um, so yeah, I don't think it should make any difference at all. Uh, Chloe, Chloe B says, hi, when creating a show reel for dance, is it inappropriate to take footage at home outdoors as opposed to just show footage with the circumstances right now I'm unable to get in a studio? Absolutely not. Make your lockdown show real. If you've got space at home, I don't think that's inappropriate at all. I think any any ability that you have to show your skills is useful. It's better than no skills being on show. So I think go ahead. I mean, obviously, make it as good quality as you possibly can and within the limitations that you have. But if you've got a decent outdoor space or you've got quite a large room that you can do a, a good dance reel in, then why not? We just want a demonstration of your skills. We don't care where you are. In fact, um, sometimes, and again, we've been saying this through these industry surgeries, we've been doing a lot of show reels. It's saying, um, certainly when I was a, a, a performer on ships, I was really fixated with putting as much content as I could from the shows that I've been in. Oh, that costume looks amazing. Or I'm in this great lift when I'm singing. Or this number was amazing. And actually now I'm on this side of it. I, all of that becomes um, noise a little bit, unless it's so clear, unless you are the central figure, whether you're singing or dancing or playing an instrument, whatever you're doing, or, or even acting. Unless that show reel is literally showcasing you, it just becomes uh, very um, yeah. difficult for us to digest. Particularly, um, I find it a lot in dance show reels where there's so much footage, and then there's kind of like a an arrow, or it says at the bottom, "Stage right, second dancer from left." And by the time yeah. I process that, the clip's gone. I am yeah. like, there are oh, lit by the Prince of Darkness, and then you oh, know. Yeah. That, I mean, that that is not that is such a good point because I would I would definitely way prefer um those those clips on dance show reels that's exactly as you're describing then that maybe them doing like a really awesome routine or something in a really funky show and it looks amazing but I am trying to make sure that if I'm is that the right is that the person I'm supposed to be looking at I would much rather just see you in an empty space saying here's me doing my triple pirouettes here's me uh doing um this style of dance here's me doing that style of dance thanks mm. very much for watching the end like that's i i want to know about you so um yeah. that's really valid Rosie. that that's i you know we don't really care about it being in a show it's absolutely fine to be in an empty space and just being you absolutely and don't make it too long i don't need to sit through six and a half minutes of show reel um and and time code guys if you're doing a four minute reel especially for vocal reels say at the bottom at zero 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 this happens at one minute 20 so that an agent can say do you know what actually i can't remember if 
um, Chloe has this piece of footage. Can she tap? Oh, yeah, wait a second. On the time code, it says tap at this point, and then you can jump straight in and see the experience. So signpost for us. Remember, agents and casting directors in normal times are incredibly busy. So the easier you make the material to navigate, the more likely you are to be called in the room. Um, a couple of quick questions to finish off. I can't believe how quickly the session's gone. Amazing questions. Uh -huh. Um, Sophie says, how do you as agents, casting directors feel about actors you represent or approaching you for representation who create their own work, such as writing or producing short films? Uh, personally, I think that's really cool um, and I feel great about that. Um, I think it's, it's great because, you know, I mean, artists are going to be creative people. So lots of artists then have a pull towards directing or maybe choreographing and definitely writing and maybe with a view to producing in the future or maybe you're starting to produce already. I think that's amazing and absolutely you should push on with that. You know, yeah, anything that's creative, you should be getting involved in. So that would be a big yes for me. Um, amazing, exactly, yeah. I mean, we just love to see people who are creative and, you know, creating their own path and yeah, amazing. Uh, Chloe says, thank you so much for taking the time to answer. Um, Lorna, who asked earlier about um, doing um, uh, um, background artist work, uh, says, thanks for the answer. You're really lucky in getting lines in a couple of shows and even have a character. Oh upcoming show I always hope that I'm memorable to the director in a good way um there's a question which is way back in the feed um but someone was asking about proactivity what should the balance be between them paying for lots of sites and kind of applying for their own work versus what their um what their agent is putting them forward for uh, I know this is kind of a, a difficult question in terms of balance so it for you Fee what what is the balance between you managing the career but someone also being proactive and, and searching their own work i mean you'll get you'll get an idea for that um based on sorry i'm being interrupted <laughs> no, don't worry i've got a cat i think it's going to spring on the table any minute so just real life takes over for a second they're getting so accustomed to being on open zoom calls and just saying oh, they'll be coming and waving as well but no <laughs> call. Okay, enjoy bye bye um uh, <laughs> um, sorry, repeat the question, Rosie. Uh, proactivity. So what is the balance, yeah, balance, balance. And, a, and your client finding work? Yeah, no, I mean, the, well, I mean, the, the only reason that a balance would ever need to be struck is if there's starting to become a bit of crossover between those things. Um, and what I mean, what I mean by crossover is um, I'm trying to send a client to an audition and they're busy going for the audition of this thing that they found themselves. Just right. gonna shut the door. I'm just gonna shut the door. <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, from a casting perspective, certainly we do. Um, you know, as I said, we cast often, particularly um, overseas projects. You know, not everybody wants to work overseas. There's a hundred reasons why you may not want to go and work uh, abroad or on a ship. And we have so many projects, and we need to find so much talent that we do encourage people to write directly and say, "Look, you know, I'm interested in doing this." Uh, but obviously, as Fiona says, she may be working on getting you into something else while you're contacting us directly about that project. So, sorry, go back where you were yeah no there can just be it's just it's just if there becomes a, a bit of crossover but to be honest you know if, if something like that's happening then you know we just go into a conversation with our client about it you know mm. it, it depends on what the projects mm. are um to be honest i think the likelihood is is that you want to lean and focus on the things that your agent is seeking out as a general rule, just because they probably have access to the casting information that you're really wanting to get involved in. But that's a, that's a generalization and that's not gonna be a one size fits all. Um, so it depends on the projects that we're speaking about and really you just keep an open dialogue about it and make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page and that you know it's not causing any problems. If it is, then you just have to talk about it. Um, we just have time for one more question. This is from Megan. This is a really great question. It says, hello, I'm a Scottish actor. And with regards to self-taping solar material for sending with emails, would you suggest using native accents as opposed to something else? Thank you. Yes. Yes. We want to hear what you sound like. That's the most interesting thing. Um, it's useful to hear other accents. So you don't have to just use one accent in your entire cell tape. You can do snippets of other accents, but the most important thing is that we hear what you sound like. Um, mm -hmm. 
in your native accent, I think, because because we're learning about you first and foremost. Um, and if we want to find out more, we can find out more, or you can give us a little more further down the line. Perhaps you can do, you know, sort of say, great, okay, so um, just to check that you're really solid with your general American, can you send us a self taste mm -hmm. accent? If that's really important to us, then we'll ask for it. But I would say um, uh, go with your native accent, yes. I think there's a real lean towards, I'm uh, saying this a lot again recently, um, but towards authenticity at the moment, a uh, big lean towards using regional accents, people's real accents away from, let's say, using RP or even singing in American accents. I'm sitting in a lot of audition rooms where um, a director will suddenly go, that's lovely, thank you for singing that in the American accent. Can you just do it in your own accent? People go, yeah. oh my God, I've never ever sung anything in my own accent before. But yeah. Like you say, it's a way of getting to know somebody. It's a different, uh, it's a different dynamic with a song or a monologue when you do it in your own accent. And I think um, it's brilliant. I love that we're now, over the last kind of five to ten years, really opening up this um, embracing of of natural and regional accents. I think it's brilliant. Yeah. We yeah. do. Never, I very rarely get asked for someone to turn in something in RP, or they're going to be asked to read the script in RP. Very rarely. I mean. I, I can't even remember the last time that happened. Um, we have more questions, but we are out of time. And Fiona has given us 90 minutes of her very precious time this afternoon uh, amongst uh, being mum to two, a uh, super mum uh, to two twins, uh, running Keddy Scott Associates. And also she is uh, constantly seems to be in some kind of training uh, for uh, long distance. She's a long distance triathlete um, and seems to always be up at 5 a.m. training. So I don't even know where you find the time for that all in real life, let alone giving us your time. I just want to say a few thank yous that have popped up. Uh, here we go. Anna says, thank you for answering all the insightful information. Helen Fox, thank you very much for giving your time. Much appreciated. Thank you, Fiona. Rosie, for your time. Very helpful. Christopher says something about the cat, but the cat's gone. Thank you for all your time today. Mia Rose, thank you. This has been so helpful. Uh, great Q and A says Sarah Maddox. Uh, just there are so many, so many thank oh, you okay. from everyone. Just saying thank you for this. Um, Jennifer says, "Wow, Superwoman!" Uh, thank yeah. you. For those. Really <laughs> so, <not>. Yes. <laughs> um, if anyone, I know you're currently not open for representation, uh, for you personally. Um, but if people want to get in touch with your agency and are looking for representation, what's the best way to do that? Uh, we have a dedicated email address. It's info at keddyscott.com. Um, and yeah, at, at some point, all of those emails are read. I can't guarantee when they're read, obviously, at any given time, but they're always, they're always looked at, I promise. Amazing. I know this has been helpful for so, so many people. So thank you, please, so much. I'm going to take you out of the live stream, but don't leave the studio yet because I want to say goodbye. But from everyone <laughs> watching, thank you so, so much. And uh, we'll get you back on very soon again, I'm sure, to have another Q&A with us. So thank really? you. Bye, everyone. Guys, I'm so sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions. We are going to have more Q&As um, with agents who uh, work in different areas of the industry, such as uh, voiceover agents. Um, so just hold tight, and we are in the process of organizing more uh, Q&As. We'll also have feedback at some point in the next six months to talk uh, more about the industry and her amazing insights. We literally could have talked for hours. And thank you for your brilliant questions as well. Um, that concludes today's uh, classes. Just to talk a little bit about uh, tomorrow. It is Wednesday the 10th. My gosh, we're nearly halfway through the week. We're starting tomorrow. We have an advanced jazz class with the lovely Ashley Luke Lloyd, so get limbering for that. Um, at 11.30, historical context of musicals with Franny Ann Rafferty. This ties in with a clean up your rep session that Jordan Lee Smith is going to be doing on Friday, so make sure you uh, get, tap into both of those. They're going to be talking about different musicals throughout the, uh, throughout the last, I guess, 100 years um, and how to tie those in with understanding and cleaning up your rep folder better. We have a mental health Q&A with Mary Birch. So uh, we are open to no, no subject is off limits tomorrow to talk about how best to look after our mental health in this time and to answer any specific questions. You can ask those questions anonymously, but again, you need to be signed into YouTube so you can change your name. Um, uh, beginner's Music Theory with Katie Richardson. If you've always wanted to know what all those little dots and squiggles mean on sheet music, uh, now is your chance. She runs the course currently at Aura or has uh, at least prepared 
prepared that course. So uh, make sure, not Aura, Anta. Oh gosh, she'll call me. Um, so uh, make sure you tune in. Anyway, she is an expert in, in creating um, courses based around uh, understanding and beginning to learn about music theory. And then creating a voiceover reel with uh, accent and voiceover specialist Judy, M Judith McSpadden. It's definitely time for me to sign off. It's I've talked way too much today. That's at 4.45. Don't forget to get on the socials as well. And uh, please tag people that you've uh, enjoyed classes and sessions from. Um, and uh, please keep spreading the love. We are at CCI 2020 on Twitter. We are at Collective Creative Initiative on Instagram. And we are using the hashtag CCI2020. Um, thank you so much again for tuning in today. This session will be on YouTube for another month, so you can come back if there are any questions that you missed. Uh, but again, thank you so, so much to all of you. Have an amazing evening, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.